if I was starting a project tomorrow, this is how I would do authentication. I would set it up myself, especially for the MVP, which usually only needs a simple way to log in. I don't have anything against paying for an authentication service. I think the philosophy of outsourcing both DevOps and auth is a totally fine methodology, especially if you're bad at it. For whatever reason, I've always preferred to minimize the number of SaaS services that my project relies on and learn to set up my own systems. Speaking of services, the one I always get is a VPS to host my server, which brings me to today's sponsor, Hostinger. If you go to hostinger.com slash binawad, you can sign up for a limited time deal. You're gonna wanna choose your plan, and this is where Hostinger really shines. Because they offer longer term VPSs, they have insane pricing. I'm used to paying double, if not triple, for the same resources. And you could go for the KVM1 to start, but I just like going with the KVM2. Only for $2 more, you get double the specs. And this is just a good way to start your project and you'll be able to handle any traction you get at the beginning. And then pick the link that you want. I'm gonna go for 24 months for the best savings. And make sure to scroll down and press have a coupon code and put Benawad for additional savings. Yay. Go ahead and fill this out and submit the form. Afterwards, it'll take us to the dashboard and we'll set this up. Pick the location that's closest to your users. Phoenix will work well for me. I like to go with Ubuntu for the OS. You can keep this on. Make sure you save the password you create and your setup is done. Just give it a few minutes to boot up. We're gonna copy this and go to our terminal. Paste it in. Yes. And then put the password you have from earlier and bam, you're in. You now have access to your VPS. Check the description of this video for a GitHub repository link that'll walk you through how to deploy your authentication stack. Decision number one. I'm now a big fan of starting projects with only OAuth, aka login with Google. The main reason is it's simpler from a coding perspective and when you're onboarding new users to your project, the initial signup is faster. You don't have to implement email confirmation or forgot password. Google will handle that for you. There is one caveat though. Not all OAuth providers do the same level of validation. Discord, for example, lets you create an account with any email you want and then just log in to OAuth services that require Discord. I can create a Discord with the email zuck at facebook.com and then log in to any website that has login with Discord. Now, after a user signs in, I believe Discord does tell you whether their email is verified or not. So you can, in your server, check and decide whether you want to allow that user in. I just was surprised by that being the default behavior for Discord OAuth. I would have considered that user's account not officially signed up and so they shouldn't be able to log into other services. Since you don't have to implement forgot password and confirm email most of the time, for many projects, I don't even buy an email provider because I don't need to send any emails. Now, some of you might still want to do email marketing, in which case, sucks to suck, you gotta buy it. In my opinion, the biggest downside to OAuth is you're relying on another company. So if their auth server goes down, users cannot log into your website. So keep that in mind. I think it's a fine trade-off because Google and Discord, their auth services aren't down very often at all. And if they are, they're not down for very long. It's also good to note that if a user's Discord account or Google account gets banned or deleted, they can no longer log into your service with the account that they had before. So keep a backup plan intact for scenarios like this. This happens extremely rarely, but what I'll usually do is have the user send me an email from the email that they have on their account for verification. And then I'll just attach another Discord to their account and they're good to go. Okay, let's talk about how this actually works now. After a user presses the login with Discord button, they'll be sent to your server. Your server will most likely be using a library like Passport.js if you're in the Node.js world, and you'll redirect them to Discord to put in their credentials. Once that's done successfully, Discord will send that person's Discord profile to your server. There might be an intermediate exchanging of tokens, but your OAuth library will usually handle that for you. Your server will take the Discord profile and grab the Discord ID of that user and look it up in your database to see if you already have a user with that Discord ID if you do, congratulations, you now know who the user is. And if you don't, you just need to create an account for them, which usually means inserting them into the database. Here's another big decision point. Now that you know who the user is, you need to decide how you want to keep them logged in as they continue to use your website or app. The most popular two options are session storage or JWTs, which stands for JSON Web Token. Sessions are simpler. You create a table in your database and you store and create a temporary ID, usually called a session ID, and you map that to a user ID that the user session is for. You then give the session ID to the website or app, and every time they make an API call, 
they send up that session ID and you can look up who the user is. One nice benefit of this is you can revoke anyone's access at any time by deleting the session in the database and the user would have to log in again. The downside of sessions is every time that the website sends an API call, you have to do a database request just to see who the user is. A common way to combat this is instead of storing the sessions in your database like PostgreSQL, you store it in a place like Redis, which is faster to query and has a built-in way to expire data. Even then, you might want to avoid the database or Redis call altogether, or you might be in a scenario where it's difficult to do one. Say you're doing microservices. And in that case, you may want to consider JWTs. A JWT is a special type of token that is created with three inputs. Some data that you want to store, commonly you'll stick the user ID in there, an expiration date when the token is no longer valid, and a secret string that is used to cryptographically sign the token. Data inside a JWT is public. Anyone can decode and see what's inside, even if they don't have the secret string. But the reason we sign it with this secret string is for validation purposes. When you send the token to your server or another microservice, use the same secret string to validate you made the token, because you're the only one that should know what that secret is. Also part of the validation is making sure that the token is not expired. It's convenient not to have to do a database call to decode and validate the token, but the downside is, is you can't invalidate this token early if you want to, if all you're doing is checking the secret and the expiration date. If you had a button on your website that a user can press to log out of all devices, you would need to terminate tokens early to implement that functionality. But if that user was already logged in on their phone with a JWT that expires in a month, you kind of just have to wait a month for that to expire. Unless you change the signing secret, but that would invalidate all tokens for all users and essentially log everyone out of your website. You usually only do that if you get hacked or something. Trick to making this work is having your JWTs be short-lived. Say they only last for five minutes or one hour or four hours, depending on how fast your application needs to invalidate tokens. If we stop there, the user is just gonna be logged out every five minutes or one hour, which is not ideal. So what we do is we introduce a second token, which lasts longer and is usually referred to as the refresh token. So when a user logs in, you now give them two JWTs, a short lived one, which is usually called an access token, and then the refresh token, which I usually have last for a month or so, but you can decide how long you want the user to be logged in for. When the access token is valid, you can do API requests, but when it expires, the server then checks the refresh token. First, the server will validate the secret and expiration of the refresh token then check the database to make sure that the user is still allowed to be logged in. And if so, it will create a new access token and give it back to the user. I also like to give the user a new refresh token as well so they get a fresh 30 days of access. So in this scenario, if your access token lasts 15 minutes, you only have to do a database call once every 15 minutes to generate a new access token. Whereas with sessions, if you did 100 API calls in 15 minutes, your server would do 100 database requests just for validating the authentication. Now back to our example button that allows the user to log out of all devices. This is how you would implement it with the JWT setup. A simple method is to store a refresh token version on your user table. And then whenever you create a refresh token, you stick that version inside of it. Then when you validate the refresh token, you check whether the version matches the one in the database. And if it doesn't, the token is considered invalid. So let's say a user logs in on their phone and then logs in on their computer and the current refresh token version is set to one. As the user uses the website, every 15 minutes when the access token expires, the server will check the refresh token and make sure the version matches the one in the database. And if it does, I'll give them a new access token and they keep going. Then when the user presses the log out of all devices button, you increment the refresh token version field and immediately all the refresh tokens are invalidated. Now it's important to note this doesn't do anything to their access token. They just can't get a new one unless they log in again. So when the log out of all devices button is pressed, it's gonna take a few extra minutes for it to take effect on all devices as you wait for the access tokens to naturally expire. On one device, they might have an access token with two minutes left. On another, they might have four minutes left and you just have to wait. And again, you get to decide the maximum amount of time that you wanna wait for these tokens to expire by setting what you want the access token expiration date to be. And you just have to weigh that against how often you wanna be doing database requests to create these new tokens. I've been using JWTs lately, but whether you decide to use them or sessions, you still need to decide where to store the tokens on the user's computer or phone to keep them logged in. 
For apps, it's easy. If you're using React Native, you just use this thing called Secure Storage and you're good to go. On websites, you get the pleasure of choosing between cookies or local storage. The short answer is you should probably just use cookies with the following settings in production. Have HTTP only on, so it can't be accessed by JavaScript. Secure should be set to true, so it only works in HTTPS. And same site should be set to lax to protect against CSRF attacks. I recommend checking out the OWASP website if you want to know more about these values. It's a really good resource for security. The special thing about cookies is if you set credentials to true whenever you do a fetch request, the browser will automatically send any cookies stored on that domain up to the server without you needing to send an auth header or anything. If you choose to use local storage, you'll have to set the auth header yourself, but that's not really a big deal. I think it's okay to use local storage, but commonly you'll see online people saying to never store tokens in local storage because it is vulnerable to XSS, which stands for cross-site scripting. And what that really means is if somebody is able to inject JavaScript code into your code, they can make that malicious. And one of the malicious things they can do is steal your tokens from local storage. Whereas if you're using cookies and you have the HTTP only flag on, they can't because they, the cookies can't be accessed through JavaScript that way. The problem with this logic is, yes, it's bad if somebody's able to steal your tokens from local storage, but if somebody is able to inject malicious JavaScript code into your code, bad things are gonna happen even if you're using cookies and they can't steal your tokens. The bad agent will just make malicious API calls on your behalf instead of stealing your token and then doing the same thing. The argument is the attack vector is larger for local storage, which I get, but the moral of the story for me is just don't make your website vulnerable to XSS. The last part of authentication, which sometimes is confusing, is on the front end, where you wanna know whether a user is logged in or not. And especially can be confusing is if you do not use local storage and you're using cookies and you can't access your token using JavaScript. The solution is simple. You make an API call to your server every time a user comes to your website and you let the server decide who the user is. The server will read the cookie if there even is one and then it will validate it and it'll get the current user for you. If there is no user, the server will reply that there is no user and usually just redirect them back to the login screen. There you have it. That is how I would do authentication. To recap, you first choose how you want users to log in, either with OAuth or username and password, or maybe a combination of both. If this video is popular, I'll do one with how I like to set up username and password and everything that goes along with that. Then you pick sessions or JWTs. And finally, whether you use cookies or local storage to persist tokens on the user's computer. I have a GitHub repo in the description of this video that you can check out an example setup of authentication that uses Discord OAuth, JWTs, and cookies which is my usual go-to these days. And I want to officially welcome you to the Roll Your Own Authentication Club. It's good to finally have you.